Thank you all for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Hello, my name is Timon Wall, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this one, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy tonight's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape our future programming. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with the microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. And now please welcome the Associate Director of the Dole Institute, Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Tim, and good evening. And certainly welcome to our 10th anniversary series. I think most of you know that the Dole Institute of Politics is celebrating its 10th anniversary. And tonight's program on disabilities, the evolution of equality with David Morsey. But before I introduce the program, I would like to call your attention to the upcoming events. Right now we're in the middle of KU civic engagement and leadership, and it's an opportunity for our students to be uh, more involved in civic engagement, trying to make a difference in the lives of the community as well as our campus, and that runs through October the 31st. For those of you, I think you know that National Make a Difference Day is October the 26th, so it's recognized all over the United States. Also look at October 27th. It's a program we're very proud of. We give the Dole Leadership Prize, and this year we will be awarding the $25,000 prize to the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, which is the equivalent of a presidential library. Uh, Mets, President Mandela will not be here, but his great-grandson, will be speaking and accepting the award on his behalf. And I hope you will find time on the 27th to come out because we all know what President Nelson Mandela went through from apartheid to believing in what should happen in a country and the equality for all. Also, if you'll notice our program on October the 30th, the work of Richard Ben Kramer by Mark Swansker and I think that will be an excellent program for you as well. The Leavenworth series, for those of you who have not participated in it, but you're very interested in what's going on all around the world, at home and abroad, selected topics on World War II. And I can tell you, we have a great crowd every time we have a new series, and I think you will learn a lot from that. And I will put in a plug for the annual Veterans Gala. For those of you who have never attended it, we have over 250 people that attend every day. We turn the Dole Institute of Politics to a USO style. Where you're sitting, part of it becomes the dance floor. The Moonlight Serenade Orchestra is playing World War II type music. They're in World War II uniforms. And it's right here. And all of this happens in all of the Dole Institute of Politics. And you don't have to be a veteran to come. Just come to recognize the hard work of the veterans. Now I'd like to introduce our guest this evening. And I think many of you are familiar with him. And you would say, well, he doesn't really need an introduction. Our feeling is everyone needs an introduction, and especially someone who has spent so much of their life trying to make a difference in the lives of people with disabilities. A leader in the nonprofit sector for over a decade, David Morsey has worked to advance missions of HIV, AIDS, care and prevention, disability and independent living and community volunteerism. He has presented internationally on uh, developing disabled people's organizations and transition to adulthood for youth with disabilities. I think we know how important it is that all of us may have something that makes us different. 
But when we have something that makes us different and people use that against us, that to me is discrimination. And I think we recognize that. And every city, every town, every state can do a much better job in making so much more accessible and recognizing that people with disabilities can do anything that almost anyone else can do and they have some limitations. But the question I would ask, do we not all have some kind of limitation? As a 2007 Disability Policy Leadership Fellow for the Association of University Centers on Di Disability, Morrissey went on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Expert Working Group on Transition at the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. In 2010, he served as private sector advisor in the United States delegation in the United States Universal Periodic Review of the U.S. Human Rights Record. He was a member of the inaugural class of the Clinton School of Public Service, where he earned his Master of Public Service degree and conducted service projects in the Arkansas Delta and in Vietnam. I would say for a minute, please think about Senator Bob Dole. Severely wounded in World War II, he did not let a disability stop him <laughs> from continuing to serve his Kansas, his Kansas constituents and the U.S. Senators elected him because of his ability, not his disability. He served, and he served well. And he left this country much better than how he found it when he was elected. I would ask you all to please welcome David Morsey this evening Give him a warm Jayhawk welcome, and I will turn this program over to the director of the Dole Institute of Politics, Bill Lacey. David, welcome tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. It's a fabulous crowd tonight, so we really appreciate your support. Uh, David, I think a lot of people in the room probably know you or know a little bit about you, but uh, some people probably don't. So spend a few moments talking about your personal background, education, how you were raised, and how you decided to get into being an advocate for uh, the disabled. Sure. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. It's really uh, old home week. Uh, it's a chance for me to be back in my home state. I'm Kansan, uh, born and bred. I was born in Topeka and, and was raised there. I lived in Lawrence, Kansas for many years of my life, as well as the community of Overbrook, Kansas and uh, worked here in Lawrence for the United Way of Douglas County, uh, for the Douglas County AIDS Project, uh, volunteered and served on the board of Independence Inc., our Center for Independent Living here in the Lawrence community. And so uh, being here, even though it's just for a few days this week, has been a great opportunity to see some old friends and colleagues that really launched me on my career in public service. It was uh, after college, that I got into working in the nonprofit sector here in Lawrence, and after uh, probably uh, seven years uh, in uh, different projects, uh, had the opportunity to go to graduate school, and it was the first time in my life that I relocated out of Kansas. And uh, with my partner, Jeff Kirkendall, the two of us uh, bravely left Kansas and moved to Little Rock, Arkansas uh, on uh, the opportunity of the Clinton School of Public Service, uh, a scholarship that en enabled me to pursue a master's in public service. Uh, during that uh, curriculum was when I spent four months living in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, Vietnam, uh, working with disability groups on the ground in the country. And it was that experience that really gave me the bug to uh, work in international disability issues that has me doing this work today. What's one of the more amazing stories or experiences you had when you were in Vietnam or in Arkansas that just that just convinced you that this is the kind of this was going to be your passion for your life? Yeah, uh, you know, I always um, having um, a personal experience of having been born with a birth defect, uh, spina bifida, and having um, family members who, in their own work, um, have been so closely involved with the disability community and. They, in so many ways, um, aside from my own personal experience, inspired me to uh, pursue a life of service to the disability community. 
that um, it was in Arkansas that I was working um, with a, a greater focus more in the developmental disability community. And uh, that community is uh, probably still where so much of my heart is. And uh, it was uh, the expertise that I developed in graduate school at, in working in public policy around disability that enabled me to uh, take that next career step and, and move to Washington, D.C. to work on developmental disability policy at the national level. Um, but I think it was these mentors along the way who have devoted their lives um, in service to uh, a community of citizens who are often uh, marginalized, are often um, excluded from full participation uh, that empowered me or inspired me to uh, want to commit my life to that work. In Vietnam, uh, the marginalization of people with disabilities is beyond our friends who have intellectual disabilities. It, it was, um, you know, I saw it more impactful to people with mobility impairments or to the deaf community. And so every country is at their own place now in moving forward to build a society of equality and one that tears down barriers. And Vietnam is at a really uh, exciting place in their own journey uh, toward building that society as well. Okay. What's the mission? You work now for the U.S. International Council on Disabilities. What's the mission of the organization and what is your role in the organization? I'm the executive director and our mission is to engage the American disability community with the global disability community. We serve as the United States member in an international organization called Disabled Peoples International, DPI. Every country, I hope one day, will have a DPI uh, community. It's one that is led by people with disabilities, staffed by people with disabilities, and is working to uh, be an advocacy force in moving their country forward toward greater inclusion, ending discrimination, uh, and generally uh, working toward that ideal of a, a fully inclusive society. Uh, we also carry a consultative status at the United Nations, and it uh, can provide the opportunity to make sure that People with disabilities are at the table as world, the world table brings governments together. We need to make sure that uh, civil society voices are at the table too. Um, and that's not just people with disabilities, those are our families, our caregivers, uh, and all the folks who together can be, again, building that inclusive global society. Talk a little bit more directly to what you do. What does the executive director do? What are your responsibilities? What is, you probably don't have an average day, but what does your somewhat average day look like? Um, well, it's interesting because our organization really is in some ways a policy shop in Washington. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have great colleagues who are more uh, focused on on the ground development work in countries around the world. And we try to be a resource to help the development sector think more about disability, not programs that are specifically for people with disabilities, but mainstream programs, education, health programs, water programs. How do we make sure that uh, vulnerable populations are not being excluded and left out from these important initiatives? And I think that for you, the American taxpayer, to know that your tax dollars, when they are being spent overseas, are being spent in a way that uplifts people with disabilities and doesn't further marginalize those who are uh, frankly, uh, in many situations, in a, a situation of poverty um, or uh, being denied education. I think that's a concern to us all, that the work of our government overseas is, is good work. And so that advocacy that we engage in, there never is a typical day, um, but there's always an opportunity to stand up and to be an advocate. Uh, that's the uh, good stuff of it. On the, you know, there's also the administration when you're an executive director, and we're a small organization, so one minute my head's in the books looking at the budget and seeing how we're going to get this work done, or I'm, you know, trying to entice funders to believe in our vision and to uh, help us get that work done, and um, it's an honor to get to do the work. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, give us some history on the evolution of attitudes in this country about disabilities. Well, in two... Kind of sketch it for us over okay. a period of years. Uh, you know, and I have benefited in my career from my uh, mentors and policy elders, those advocates who 
blazed a trail for disability inclusion. You know, uh, a gentleman named Ed Roberts was told he couldn't go to college because he was in an iron lung. And he said, no, there's no reason that I shouldn't be able to pursue my education to the next level. And he uh, broke down that barrier. And while um, UC Berkeley uh, um, became a, because of his work and the work of others, the, uh, a real spark in the American um, in our country to uh, think about disability in a new way, uh, to think about the capacities and talents of individuals uh, that sometimes with just um, support or uh, tweak to infrastructure, uh, anyone can pursue their dreams. And certainly we know that everyone can learn. And so the opportunity to pursue education is um, core to uh, self-fulfillment and the opportunity to be the best we can be. That um, civil movement uh, really picked up in the civil rights movement a, a social justice model that empowered people with disabilities to, uh, starting with, I, I think, um, some profound moments included uh, the Rehabilitation Act that said that uh, persons with disabilities should have full access to federally funded programs. Um, to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, that really changed the way we think about the inclusive classroom, that um, students with disabilities can learn with their peers who do not have disabilities, and that it enriches the classroom to have different learners with different talents together, learning together, because that's really what our society is. And so these key moments in uh, American policymaking, uh, certainly, uh, a key moment is the Americans with Disabilities Act, now uh, 23 years old. Uh, we'll be celebrating the 25th anniversary in 2015. Um, it's many of those advocates that made the ADA happen that are my mentors today that are working day and night to bring the U.S. to now the next step, uh, which is uh, to join the Global Treaty on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Okay. Well, let's go to that then. Uh, uh, you know, that's been your big effort, Senate ratification of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or CRPD is the acronym. Mm -hmm. Why is CRPD important and mm -hmm. what would it accomplish? Well, you know, in 1990 when the ADA was passed, the world community really took notice of this. This was a pioneering concept that we would enshrine in law that citizens with disabilities were equal citizens, that uh, discrimination against disabled citizens could not stand and that it was a role for society to tear down those barriers. Uh, that sparked a global movement and we saw countries around the world take their own approach to embracing disability rights. Um, and as we saw different countries move forward in their own unique way, uh, the idea of a global standard around disability rights uh, really emerged, and it was in 2000 that um, the United Nations um, launched a treaty drafting process that would um, create that global standard. The process itself was uh, life-changing, world-changing, uh, because it wasn't a handful of international lawyers sort of back in a back office drafting a treaty together and coming out and unveiling it saying, look at this wonderful treaty we've crafted, but rather it was an inclusive process that set a big table at the UN that made sure that people with disabilities were at the table, that governments sent not just their ambassadors, but persons with disabilities as official government delegates to this process. So it reinforced and uh, really um, created a volume around the global slogan, nothing about us without us, that said, if there's going to be a treaty about my rights, I'm going to be at the table, or my organization that represents me is going to be at that table. And it really has changed the world. Today, over 150 countries have signed the treaty, and we're seeing the impacts um, on a daily basis. Countries are now using the Disability Treaty as a guide star to develop their own uh, legislation to make uh, 
this vision real at, at home. And I want to see my country at the table with these countries to help share the knowledge we've developed more than 20 years after the ADA and even more years from some other pieces of, of law and are just our regular practice in towns, states, and uh, around this country. Uh, we have a lot to share. And so I think it's important that we take that on. I think there's other great cases for why the U.S. should be at the table. Certainly the business sector is increasingly interested. The, uh, great technologies that serve people with disabilities. That's a new market in the global community. And I think that companies like IBM and AT&T and others who support ratification of the treaty see that uh, it, by our country coming to the table and affirming this global standard, we're showing we speak the same language, our products serve the same end, and that it's in our corporation's interest to have access to those global markets. If we're not at the table, we know that other countries who are quickly developing technologies themselves are going to fill that market. And so we have an opportunity to get there. I think for students with disabilities who want to travel the world, study abroad, those doors have been closed to students for many years because the world has been inaccessible. And the U.S. can help build an accessible world by being at the table with countries, sharing our knowledge, and sending our students abroad to make it real. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that the American veteran community has really embraced this issue, uh, inspired by Senator Dole, that today's veteran, particularly this new generation of young vet, has an expectation that the accessible world they grew up in is not just here, it's out there too. And they don't want to be limited in their pursuing their educational dreams, pursuing uh, career opportunities. Uh, to take advancement uh, in companies that want to send them abroad that won't be deterred just because that employee uses a wheelchair. Um, this is an exciting opportunity as the world is moving forward for the U.S. to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize the impact of CRPD on federal and state law inside the United States? Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, so uh, I was I, not just me, I, my brothers and sisters with disabilities around the United States and around the world were so excited when uh, President Obama fulfilled his campaign pledge that we would sign the treaty and the U.S. became a signatory in 2009. Uh, the President then had his administration uh, do a multi-year study of uh, the treaty, looking at what's the vision of the treaty and where's U.S. law and is there a gap between the two and how do we close them in order to come on board as a ratified party? The um, standard U.S. treaty practice is that we don't ratify a treaty unless we're already uh, perceived or deemed in full compliance. And we um, were so pleased last year in 2012, after a three-year process, the administration submitted a package to the U.S. Senate where a supermajority vote is required to successfully ratify. Um, and it was a package that required uh, no new costs and no changes to U.S. law. The administration proposed a series of amendments to the treaty called Reservations, Understandings, and Declarations that um, laid out uh, things like our federalist system of government, uh, some areas of disability are at the state level in terms of laws, they're not federal laws. And when the United States ratifies a treaty, we are making that commitment at the federal level. And if a state is not yet um, fully in the uh, compliance with the treaty, um, the federal government will work with those states to realize uh, the vision of the treaty and, and come into compliance not the international community interfacing directly with states. Mm -hmm. And so this package that is before the Senate is um, a very sound mm -hmm. practice that has followed, um, uh, I don't know how many years of standard U.S. treaty practice. It protects our sovereignty. Uh, it doesn't cede our lawmaking authority to foreign governments. Um, it's one in which we are in compliance. We will not uh, have new costs leveled as a result and yet the opportunities that I was just describing to be a world leader on this issue, I think are significant. Okay, so, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but as I kinda of understand the way you're explaining it, uh, it's not gonna really change that much in the U.S., but it 
puts us at the table and makes us a leader on disabilities around the world. Is that a fair I think that restatement? the um, opportunity to be influential in the world is a change for Americans with disabilities who, again, want to have that opportunity to be out in the world. Uh, you know, the U.S. is still making the vision of the ADA real here at home. 23 years past the ADA, our employment rates for people with disabilities are still not great. They're twice the unemployment rate for citizens who don't have disabilities. And so we still are evolving ourselves here at home, and we're doing that under our domestic legal framework. Uh, the treaty can become a new tool in advocates' toolkits as we work to advocate for better policies, uh, for a more inclusive society, even here at home. It's a real, um, it's a real tool because it's a real vision. But no, it's not going to force uh, those changes. Okay. What happened? Uh, the, the treaty's been up for a vote one time. Tell us what happened. So uh, it was last May that that package was submitted to the U.S. Senate. Because this is a treaty, it lands in the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Last summer, we had uh, a very good hearing in which uh, senators from both uh, parties really stood up for this issue, that it was the right thing to do. Um, and it was a robust process that really examined all the issues um, so that ultimately the committee was able to pass a resolution for ratification that had bipartisanship, um, that um, then had momentum to move on the Senate. Um, that was uh, in July, uh, just after the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act that that package passed. It wasn't until December that we had a vote in the Senate. And we got close, but we didn't uh, hit the mark. We missed the supermajority by five votes. And it was immediately after that loss that uh, great figures like John McCain um, and Richard Durbin, um, Tom Harkin, and other members of the Senate said, don't give up. We can get this done. This is the right thing to do. We're going to bring it back. And so. Um, while the loss was disappointing, uh, we have tried to make the most of it by um, certainly we got great media coverage uh, that day. Senator Dole attended the vote mm -hmm. with his wife Elizabeth, uh, and um, that was that sparked more media than we ever got in the run-up uh, to the vote. Um, it also helped expand uh, the coalition. At the time, our coalition for ratification was about 350 disability organizations. Today, it's over 700 disability organizations from the local, state, and national level. Uh, we had the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on board uh, last year. Now, it's not just uh, the chamber, but it's corporations are saying this is good for our business that we be on board. The veteran community, uh, has been solid throughout. I, I'm so pleased we have so many multiple generations standing up for this issue from uh, the VFW and the American Legion to uh, the Student Veterans of America and the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, and so it's uh, been, uh, it was tough to have that loss, but it's one that has um, steeled us and brought us together. Yeah. Now, critics have argued a point that you made a few minutes ago that it would impinge upon U.S. sovereignty and they've mm -hmm. referred to specific language within the convention that says what's in the convention overrules any U.S. law. That doesn't concern you. Well, again, I was referring to uh, standard U.S. treaty practice. Um, you know, I think that the treaty itself is uh, following um, standard um, international treaty language and countries um, do not cede their sovereignty when they make the choice to ratify. They're making a commitment to implement the treaty and make it real at home. And for so many countries around the world, they don't have a history of civil rights legislation like the ADA that now they're ratifying and they're using the treaty as a guide star to develop that. For the U.S., because we have the ADA and other pieces of law, we're already in that uh, Piece of, uh, in that posture of being in full compliance. The, um, I, I think there is a political perspective in the United States that doesn't like 
international agreements um, that doesn't like these multilateral treaties or um, international human rights standards or frankly anything that the UN has been a part of. And it may be that no um, safe package will give comfort to uh, that political perspective. I think that it's, um, it's, a, it's a minority perspective. I think there was just a recent poll uh, that great numbers of Americans from both parties, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, believe that the U.S. engagement in the U.N. is the right thing to do, that the U.N. should be at the table. And this wasn't about the disability treaty. This was about uh, the idea of global engagement and collaboration um, with our neighbors around the world through the U.N. systems. Uh, but it's important to note that this treaty in no way empowers the U.N. to take on new roles or have new powers that it didn't have before. It doesn't. Uh, really, this is a treaty that empowers people with disabilities. Uh, it's a treaty that calls on countries to engage their disabled citizens and to bring them the, to the table. Again, that spirit of nothing about us without us. Okay. How can individuals who are here tonight learn more about the treaty and the effort and participate in the efforts to support it? Thank you. Um, so I think disabilitytreaty.org is uh, a great website that uh, has a lot of information about the treaty and hopefully uh, before the week is done, we will have launched a new citizen action portal on that web address that allows the visitor to, with one click, send a letter to your senator or tweet them uh, a message in support of the treaty or uh, make that call to your senator's office. Uh, also on the website, we have a lot of fact sheets and other material about the treaty that states the case. It lays out those questions that uh, our opponents have put in, it answers those questions, um, so that I want to see a process in the Senate when we do get moving again, and I think that's going to happen soon, um, that is uh, a process that shines a lot of light on the fine print so that no one is left scratching their heads about what is the commitment that the U.S. is joining 138 other countries around the world who have made this commitment to ratify um, so that we're all in it together. Okay. Um, after the treaty, what is uh, your next big challenge for USIC? I see. Um, you know, I think that once uh, we have ratified the treaty, we have an opportunity to, uh, as a, a non-governmental organization, to do that work of engaging Americans with disabilities and our allies in global solidarity with disability communities around the world. I'm particularly interested in that here regionally. I think uh, with the Caribbean nations, uh, we have a real opportunity to uh, come together and talk about uh, building uh, societies that are uh, disability inclusive. Uh, globally, I think that um, it's, a, it's an exciting time for us to take this step. So I hope to see more students with disabilities applying for those uh, study abroad opportunities. I hope to see more um, internationals with disabilities <coughs> applying to come to the United States and learn what we're doing. We're hosting a young woman from Macedonia in our office right now who it came to the U.S. to look at um, what are the systems that need to be in place that support independence because it's um, those systems are not fully in place in her home country. So she's been uh, interviewing public transportation practitioners, people who manage bus systems and train systems, um, and advocates for better systems so that she can take the knowledge she's gotten here in the U.S. back to Macedonia and be a strong advocate. And so I want to see us um, support her in that work. Okay. What would you say tonight to students who are here with disabilities or students who don't have disabilities about how they can kind of follow in your footsteps and the footsteps of other people who are trying to make a difference? What, what advice would you give them, looking back, having done it now? Um, well, I, I want to give a, a shout out to the Able Hawks. I had dinner with them last night. They're an awesome student group here on the KU campus who are doing amazing work. And one uh, campaign that they have taken on is for uh, a new wheelchair accessible entrance on Strong Hall here on Jayhawk Boulevard. Uh, there is a wheelchair entrance um, on the back of the building. You go by the trash cans and through the potholes and the puddles 
and they believe that it's not sending a message of an inclusive uh, community on campus and one that um, really doesn't support the dignity of a student with disability and they're worth that dignity and I want to see them successful in their campaign so that's an appeal to uh, the administration here at the University who've hosted me in, in such a kind way to listen to the students of Able Hawk. Um, and so I don't know that I need to give them any advice. They're stellar leaders on, on a great uh, path themselves. I, I will say that, you know, as you embark on a career in public service, uh, whether you're working in government or in the non-governmental sector, the work is heavy and it can uh, cause a dedicated public servant, I've uh, been not always but great about this, to fall out of balance in life. And so it's really important to maintain the, that balance that uh, your home life, uh, your private uh, life, those activities that enrich you, uh, particularly those activities that support your health and independence. Um, you've got to keep an eye that you're uh, keeping those uh, attended to. Yeah, absolutely. Senator, you've had the chance, as you mentioned, to get to know and work with Bob Dole. And his first speech from the Senate floor, many of you probably know this, but a lot of you probably don't. His very first speech from the Senate floor after being elected to the United States Senate in 1968 was on April 14th, 1969, and it was on disabilities. What does that say to you about Bob Dole? Uh, it says to me that he is a vanguard leader, that he didn't let his own, uh, uh, the pain uh, that he experienced in the war, the disability he developed as a result of his injuries, keep him from pursuing his education, from pursuing public service, um, for representing his constituents in a really uh, stellar way to be uh, a, a, a model statesman. Um, and so it's really been an honor to get to, uh, to know him. You know, he celebrated his 90th birthday uh, this summer, and he is still uh, working with us on the treaty. I think every day he uh, thinks about the treaty. How do we move this forward? Who can I call to, uh, uh, encourage them to give it another look, to encourage them to build a bridge uh, across the aisle politically so that that same bipartisanship that brought the ADA, it can be brought to success for the treaty. Would you encourage young people who probably don't know quite about as much about Senator Dole to, to go back and get to know a little bit more so they understand the level of that commitment? I absolutely would. I have started to uh, do a little of that myself. and. Um, Having grown up with him as my senator, uh, being a Kansan, it's really been um, eye-opening and inspiring. And even just looking around at the displays here in the hall of key moments in his political career, uh, it's, it's really exciting to um, have him as a mentor. Yeah, well I've known the guy for 27 years and he really is remarkable and a uh, uh, very, very good uh, role model. I have one last question, then we're gonna open it up to your questions and answers. I'll have a couple of students with cordless mics who will be uh, walking through the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand, be patient. Uh, don't wave at me because I'm not going to pick you out. The students will pick you out and they'll come to you and then let you uh, ask your question. But uh, my final question uh, tonight, David, is about Senator Dole and it's, uh, it's a very broad one, but I think you're very qualified to address it and that is, uh, what will his legacy be on disability issues? Um, in, last summer when we had the hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Senator Dole was not uh, feeling up to attending that day, but it was such a, a pivotal moment in this long march toward moving the treaty forward that uh, he wrote a, a statement that he asked John McCain to read to the committee that day. And so I think that just as his uh, maiden speech on the floor of the Senate has become a, a, a historically such an important moment in his career, I hope that this speech before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has uh, that same uh, inspiration that uh, is part of his legacy. He wrote in there, 
um, when we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, it was not only one of the proudest moments of my career, it was a remarkable bipartisan achievement that made an impact on millions of Americans. The simple goal was to foster independence and dignity, and its reasonable accommodations enabled Americans with disabilities to contribute more readily to this great country. When I hear his words, I think about a young Bob Dole uh, from Russell, Kansas, and the Russell, Kansas of today, like so much of this great country, is now one that uh, respects persons with disabilities, and his work has contributed to that. That from the smallest town to our greatest cities, barriers are falling, opportunities are being created, and uh, citizens with disabilities are caring for it in uh, a dignity that Bob Dole helped build. Okay, terrific. We have quite a bit of time uh, to get to questions if you have questions tonight. So Alex is over here. Raise your hand, Alex. Amanda's over here. So if you'll raise your hand, if you got a question, one of them will find you. Let me know that you got a question, and we'll start right here. All right. Um, I have a question about tying in the Strong Hall event with a more global perspective on disability. So Strong Hall is a historical monument on campus. The world also has many historic monuments. Um, so how do you balance, or what are your recommendations on balancing that need to preserve these magnificent historical structures, but also preserve the respect for people with that physical disability in order to access those great things? Um, that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, I'm not an expert on architectural uh, barriers and, and how to uh, do some of the, the finer points of uh, building inclusive environments around this. Um, I know that the um, historical challenge of many buildings is uh, one that we continue to face here. And so I think that approaching the challenge has got to be a collaborative approach uh, because I think when we approach it in a, um, with the collaboration, a spirit of collaboration, um, we can win allies and be problem solving together to and that's the part of the, our international vision, right, is to uh, bring knowledge across borders so we're helping each other build that more accessible society. Uh, I don't think it's a, um, a challenge that's solved easily um, overnight. The, even the, the treaty really is, uh, it's a vision, it's a guide star. How you make it real um, on the ground um, and at the most local place where an individual with a disability is, uh, requires um, you know, a bravery in that individual, allies around them, a community that supports them. And so it's something we all have to be in together. But it, uh, it's definitely um, a work that we have to undertake. It's a roll up your sleeves kind of work. Okay. We got lots of students here. So if you're a student, you want to ask a question, don't be shy. Do we have one over here? Appreciated your discussion tonight, Bill and David. Uh, there are some people, we're so advanced in one sense with the ADA that's been passed. Some people might ask, well, why do we really need to pass the CRPD if the ADA is kind of a model for the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities? Why do we need to do that all over again? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say we're doing it all over again. Uh, so the ADA is a, is a foundation for the United States in um, our civil rights and, and our, our treatment of our citizens with disabilities. Uh, but the treaty is larger than that. It, it spans the spectrum of life from uh, childhood to education to the workplace to the right to enter the voting booth. And so um, I think that, again, that opportunity to have a new toolkit in our um, toolbox as advocates to realize the vision of an inclusive society, um, it has value. Our opportunity to um, come to the table with the world community as a ratified party uh, is an opportunity not only for um, the American people but for our private sector interests and certainly for um, the U.S. Uh, government uh, as a voice on human rights to be able to affirm that the U.S. does stand up for human rights and um, should be at the table um, in the global human rights dialogue is an important opportunity for our country as well. Let me follow up on that real briefly, David, and ask you this. Is the U.S. one of the leading countries on disabilities in the world? 
Um, I think that uh, different countries are uh, in different places on this. And so we're seeing a lot of innovation in different aspects. Some countries have no history of institutions for their citizens with disabilities. And the vision of the treaty um, is one of independence and community living. And that even our fellow citizens who may need support uh, to live independently have a right to live independently. And it was in the US under the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision uh, a little more than a decade ago that we affirmed that same value that uh, persons with disabilities should live in the least restrictive environment. Um, and that's in the community under their own uh, guidance. And so that's a, a spot where it's hard to compare one country to another. We do have a history of institutions, and it's not just a history, it's a living experience for many Americans with disabilities today. Um, there are other countries around the world that are also grappling uh, with that issue. Um, and so for countries that haven't had that history, um, I don't want to say that they're better or best, but it's a, it's a problem that they haven't had to deal with. Okay. We have another question. Well, I'll go back to the back to Amanda then. Okay, gotcha. Hi, I was just curious if your efforts not only have means to open doors for those with uh, physical disabilities, but also those with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, I hope so. I mean, the vision of the treaty is one that doesn't separate one group from another. It refers to people with disabilities. And so uh, my hope is that um, as we work toward a, a more inclusive global society, we're not leaving anybody behind. We're uh, taking even um, persons that we might um, be inclined to perceive as um, challenging for independence. They can, we can, live in dignity and independence. Needing support is not um, uh, an embarrassment or um, something to um, be ashamed of. Who among us will not need support at some point in our lives? And if you're a person with a developmental disability that a, um, a need for support has been a part of your, your full life experience, you're still uh, an equal member of this society just as uh, a person who didn't need support and aged into needing some support in the last years of their lives. And so I hope that uh, the vision of the treaty is one that is lifting everyone up together. Okay. We've got a question right here. Yes. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, our own uh, U.S. Senator's uh, position on the treaty and uh, how we can be more effective in um, responding to some of their concerns? Thank you. Uh, well. Uh, it was a disappointment um, to not only me as a Kansan, but I think to Senator Dole and to uh, uh, many Kansans that Senators Roberts and Moran were no votes last December when given the opportunity to vote for the treaty. Um, I hope that by your efforts as advocates, um, you can implore them to give it a second look. Neither senator is seated on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at this time, so they're going to be watching themselves to see what does the committee do with the treaty? What is the package that the committee passes? When they have a package, they can give it that uh, second look. But if they don't have constituents asking them to take that second look, uh, it could be something that they could just bypass, and that would really be another disappointment. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to visit www.disabilitytreaty.org. Um, and, and take on that advocacy role, make those calls. Uh, certainly when the senators are home, uh, and if they have a, a town hall in your community, go to it uh, and raise the issue, ask them you know, to give it a second look. Uh, and I would even encourage you if you take that route, um, take people with disabilities with you. Um, and um, really, Let's uh, have a frank discussion with our lawmakers about this issue. Okay, we have a question right here. So thank you for this presentation. I'm from Senegal, West Africa, and I'm a person with a disability. Now I want to know 
I really love the idea of globalization as far as disability issues is concerned. Now, I want to know if you are ready to involve people with disabilities, international people with disabilities who are currently in the United States in, the, in your fight in, um, in, I mean, in any decision taking or in your intervention in, uh, in, inter in the international field. If we were what? If you are ready to involve people with disabilities who graduated here mm -hmm. in, your, in, your, in your intervention in the international field. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think that uh, there's a real um, hunger among international development practitioners particularly to uh, build their knowledge about disability. And again, that spirit of nothing about us without us, we need uh, professionals uh, who have disabilities to go into this work of international development and foreign policy. Uh, we've created an internship at UCID that uh, empowers uh, students with disabilities who want to work in international affairs or development to come to Washington for a summer and uh, intern in an international development NGO. And not to work on a disability portfolio of projects, but to work on the mainstream body of projects that these organizations are doing, often doing with uh, the support of the U.S. government, uh, that is a strategy to bring uh, more disability inclusion into the international development sector. Uh, as I uh, meet international development practitioners, there really is um, sort of a mix of an excitement about this new 21st century era of disability equality and non-discrimination and the idea that development programs should include people with disabilities. But there's also sort of a, a, a perplexity, how do we do it? Um, and so I think that uh, we have the opportunity to solve that for them. And so I encourage you to help solve that, yeah. Okay, we'll go back here now. David, I wanna thank you. I've learned a lot from you tonight. One thing I did want to know from you, David, have you ever worked with Justin Dart, the grandfather of disabilities? And uh, does President Obama have uh, an advocate on that president committee? Okay. I, thank you, Kathy Lobb. Kathy is a, a wonderful self-advocate in the Douglas County community who empowers and educates uh, other people with disabilities to lift their voices. And so I thank you for the work you do, Kathy. Um, I didn't know Justin Dart. I was speaking earlier about having had the benefit of inheriting the work of advocates before me who blazed a trail, and Justin was someone who did. And we have his picture hanging in our office, and I have uh, members of our board of directors who personally did work with Justin. And their voice in this work uh, brings his voice into this work. And uh, regularly uh, on conference calls or when we're uh, trying to you know, just even energize each other to carry forward in the work, we uh, will quote him. And that's uh, an honor to, to get to keep his spirit alive. His widow, uh, Yoshiko Dart, uh, lives in the Washington community and is a regular at uh, not only our events but at disability community events um, all the time. So it's a, it's a joy to get to know her and have her um, uh, adding energy to our work. Um, President Obama has um, uh, really a, a really great team of people with disabilities in his administration in the different agencies. So in the Department of Labor, looking at how do we improve employment rates for people with disabilities. Um, the administration on intellectual and um, developmental disabilities. Um, looking at um, health care and, and the new uh, ACA. How does um, this um, new day of um, health care in America include people with disabilities? Uh, you know that um, the package has um, uh, the end of uh, the exclusion of pre-existing conditions. It's something that has been, um, I think, terribly marginalizing for people with disabilities for too long. And so uh, it's exciting that this administration has done it. On the face, or on the issue of 
foreign relations. Um, many of you uh, know uh, Judy Heumann uh, served uh, in um, President Clinton's administration in the Department of Education and uh, has had other uh, great uh, experiences in her career, including at the World Bank, helping on international development think, to think about inclusion. Now she's back in uh, government service, serving as uh, the U.S. Special Advisor on International Disability Rights. And so for the State Department, uh, under the direction of Secretary Kerry, she is looking daily at the situation of people with disabilities around the world. Uh, we have a question. Oh, you have a question back there? Yes. Okay, let's get that, and I've got a question right here, Alan. Um, well, thank you. Oh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I actually uh, really enjoyed your discussion on the United Nations, um, as I am president of Model UN. So, shameless plug maybe with this question. Um, okay. As we move forward with um, issues like this and we globalize them, um, are these international structures um, the way to do this? Is this the forum that it has to be done through? Um, or most effectively done through? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, no, I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, people always find a way to solve some of our greatest challenges. I mean, particularly in the last 20 years, we've seen the real uh, expansion of social entrepreneurialism and young people who have great ideas um, not waiting for a government or international organizations to take on solving these challenges, but they're taking it on themselves. And sometimes it's one community at a time, uh, but it's making a difference. And so I think that that uh, sort of a grassroots approach has a, uh, it has a trickle up effect that then the big institutions of the world, the UNs and the WHOs and the ILOs look at that and, and see Oh, there's some really good stuff going on here. We got to get out of the way and let that stuff happen. Or how can we help support it uh, to have an even broader impact? So I think that the um, these international organizations like the UN can be um, very complex, very bureaucratic, and I wouldn't let a good idea spoil in a line waiting to try to move through those organizations when the private sector can actually push it really very effectively. Okay, we have a question right here, sir. Um, as an organization that links up with uh, disability organizations worldwide, in particular um, in the Global South, how do you account for or talk about um, the global developmental processes that are disabling to many citizens worldwide, uh, particularly um, m military conflicts, uh, pollution, mm -hmm. uh, toxic waste, and industrialization, um, those processes which are not necessarily um, talking about inclusion, but rather um, the elimination of some of these harmful practices. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I, I think that the uh, some of the uh, advocacy efforts for a cleaner environment, for example, for uh, conflict resolution are some of the most inclusive movements. They, I'm seeing people with disabilities in those movements. And so that's a, an exciting thing. And I think that reflects a younger generation that particularly here in the United States grew up in a post-IDEA world where going to school and being in an inclusive classroom, the idea that my coworkers or my co-visionaries to pursue um, world change um, is um, one that isn't foreign to them, that we can do this uh, together with people with disabilities at the table. And so um, the um, challenge that uh, uh, pollution or, or armed conflict um, is not just to um, it's to society at large, right? And so people with disabilities are, are vulnerable again. And so uh, I think about the organization um, Handicap International that is working in landmine um, eradication around the world. Um, people with uh, disabilities are, are as vulnerable to um, left behind landmines as their non-disabled neighbors. And so um, it's, a, it's an effort to 
uh, prevent additional disability uh, through this work. Okay, we have a question back here. Um, if a disability-related nonprofit organization wants to register with the ICD, uh, what steps do they need to go through to do that? Thank you. Sure. So uh, US ICD, we're a membership organization. Uh, and again, we represent the American community in, uh, in the global disability community. And so if you're an individual, you can join USID and it's $25 for your membership. Or if you are with a nonprofit organization, you can join and we have uh, membership levels for nonprofits as well. Uh, there's no test to uh, get involved, but I, I'll say we need you. We need to keep growing this um, tent of organizations that care about this issue. I, since the uh, treaty campaign has really uh, become a national campaign, I, I've been honored to get to speak to a whole variety of audiences that want to learn more and care about this issue. And so it's really exciting to be building allies uh, beyond disability stakeholders, but um, more broadly. So I encourage folks to come in. Okay, do we have any other questions? This is your chance. Okay, David, oh, yep. Then we got, wait for Mike, we got one right here. Um, I wondered with your experience internationally, we value independence and individuality so much in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, is the, will the CRPD be flexible in other nations to support they, the way they want to support citizens with disabilities? That's a great question, yes. Uh, again, the, the treaty is sort of a guide star, and it still allows co countries to develop in their own culturally relevant way um, to, um, one, yes, embrace a global standard about the human rights, dignity of, of persons with disabilities, to end discrimination. Um, I, I think that there's not a, a middle ground on that. Uh, you're making a commitment as a country to uplift your citizens with disabilities. But uh, the idea of independence, of uh, autonomy, decision making, um, to guide one's own life, uh, there are nuances in different cultures in how we do that. And I don't think that uh, a global standard like the CRPD in any way challenges that. I think it actually supports it. The, um, the treaty mentions uh, how the family is the central unit of society and that it's in the best interest of people with disabilities to have strong families around us, particularly for children with disabilities. So in no way does the treaty uh, you know, undercut uh, those core human values. Okay, we have a question here. Um, you mentioned that some companies, um, perhaps U.S. companies, had endorsed the disability treaty. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know off the top of your head what some of the names of those companies would be? We held a briefing in uh, the Senate in, on Capitol Hill uh, this past June to uh, present the business case for ratification. And some of the country companies who stood up for the treaty that day included IBM, Adobe, AT&T, uh, I think that uh, we are going to see additional companies soon um, out on a, a sort of a, a coalition letter of corporate interests all together uh, ascribing themselves to the same statement and we'll make that available on disabilitytreaty.org very soon. Okay. Any last questions? Okay, David, you're a great advocate. Thank you for joining us Thanks, tonight. Thanks, Thank you. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate your support. Have a great evening. Hope to see you at our next programs. Very nice job.